Welcome to another Lawyers, Guns, and Money podcast about Game of Thrones. I'm Scott Eric Houthman. Uh This is Stephen Adderwell. Hello. And uh, the newly filed Stephen Adderwell. Uh Yes, thank God. Uh, you got to do it electronically. All, all I'll say is you're lucky. Um, so we'll be discussing the uh, next episode of Game of Thrones, the pointy end. Uh, and I'll let Stephen, as usual, kick, it, uh, kick us off. Okay. Um, I mean... What, what's interesting about this episode is that we start with sort of a blend of things that must have happened, but you never get to see in the books, versus a very iconic chapter, um, Aria 4, in which the Lannister men are attacking the Tower of the Hand, and you see kind of the, the, the servants and you know, ordinary guardsmen uh, being massacred as Arya and Cyril Pharrell are fighting with swords. Um, and there's, you know, the things that I thought were interesting is that the, I, I love the addition of Septa Mordain's um, last stand. Because, you know, in the book she's kind of uh, almost like a, a nurse from Romeo and Juliet type character, just like a lush, um, who then end up, ends up dead. And here she's given this incredibly sort of dignified, courageous in its own way, you know, and a par an interesting parallel to, to what's going to happen with Cyril Pharrell. Um, and then we get the scene with Cyril Pharrell, which for my money uh, is definitely uh, the best uh, action sequence of season one. Uh, arguably, you know, in terms of fights, it's, it's certainly in the top five of the of the whole series to date. Um, the thing that interested me, because I, when I was writing about this chapter and making an argument about Serio Pharrell, um, this whole thing about what do we say to the god of death? Not today. Not today. It's not in the text. At no point in the books does Serio Pharrell say, what do we say to the god of death? Not today. And that really threw me because, you know, it stuck in my mind so clearly. You and sort of read it backwards into the book. Exactly. And I think it's a testament to the the, um, the skill of the, the screenwriters in coming up with a, a catch and, and the actor in terms of making this catch for his stick. But it's well, interesting uh, no, in that it... Who, who is the screenwriter for this episode, though? Well, yeah, but the... It the, is George R. R. Martin. Yes. I mean, he's the one credited with, with coming up with a line anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. But what I mean is this isn't the first – this is a callback line, right? Yeah. You know, in, a, in I think the previous episode, like there's a scene with Arya in which – Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think it's clear that Martin, like, watched the previous episode and was like, hmm, I like that line. I think I'll use that. And they were like, okay, Martin, it's your, you know, it's your series. You get to do what you want. Um, but it does change the, the feeling slightly of that scene um, in that people were arguing, well, how could someone who has this belief about, you know, you, you, you put off the, the day of your death, you fight against it, um, how could they actually be dead? How could they, you know, be a, a willing sacrifice as opposed to someone who makes a miraculous escape? And I was like, oh, shit, that really works well against my argument until someone else pointed out that's not in the books. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm safe then. Well, one of these days we'll have to have a conversation about what officially constitutes canon, given uh, Martin's involvement in the series. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot different than uh, with, you know, with, with other series where you have multiple writers and 
you know, what, what counts as, you know, in canon with Doctor Who, how many incarnations does he have, depends on who's writing it at any given point in time. In this case, you have George R. R. Martin actually, you know, there in, in, in from what I, what I can tell, like, on the conference calls with the uh, screenwriters, um, is what I'm inferring from the DVD extras from season two. Uh, so he's 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 getting a chance to revise and further tinker, micromanage, what have you. Uh, sure, and I think he's he's certainly, you know, he's enjoying the chance to sort of fix some things. Um, you know, I mean, the aging up of the cast, for example, is is an obvious one. Um, I don't think he's changed his mind about Cyril Farrell. Uh, because, you know, his public comments have all been directed at the same point. Which is that, you know, for, for Cyril Farrell, this is a kind of an ultimate last stand. It's, yeah. it's what I refer to uh, in my essay as a beautiful death. That it's, you know, this character who has stood for this idea that sword play should be about beauty and grace and not the hacking and slashing of knights is facing off against a knight who is, you know, all crudeness and brutality. He's in defense of a lady that's very much keeping with his... And he's in know, defense, defense of a boy, a boy, not a lady. All right, fine. Defense of his students. Yes. You know, um, so he's acting as a protector and a teacher. You know, and I think thematically, I can't think of a more fitting death for this character. No, it's I don't think Martin can either. It's very much in line with the, the uh, that old Leonard Cohen novel, and yes, I said novel. Um, I know he mostly did songs, but uh, he wrote a novel called *The Beautiful uh, Beautiful Losers*, and it's all about Native Americans. And it's it, it's a little weird, it's a little raunchy, as you would expect from Leonard Cohen. But it's a sort of understanding of um, Native Americans as mm -hmm. you know they went out the right way is I guess right. the best way to One put second. it. One second. Okay. Well, Stephen's gone, I'll tell you all his dirty secrets, such as when he filed his application this week. Oh, I was just going to say that in terms of re re revising things, um, one thing that you, Stephen, will find out very quickly is that there is a typo on the first page of the dissertation you just submitted. Uh, you got the name of your advisor wrong in the uh, opening acknowledgments. Uh, at least that's been my experience. Um, all right. <laughs> no, that my only problem was that I made every last fix imaginable. And then forgot to hit accept on all of the track changes. Oh. So initially it got bounced back to me as saying, uh, we need the final version. This has track changes on it. And I was like, wait, this is the final version. Oh, I didn't hit accept, did I? And I felt really stupid. Fuck! Yeah, I... I uh, God, filing a dissertation. They, they leave the, the most difficult task for a, an academic to last, which is to organize everything in the proper format and submit it along yeah. with all the proper uh, forms. Um, okay, so uh, as for Serio uh, and, and his death, you were, you were talking about how this fight scene is actually sort of one of the top five. I think it's easily the best directed fight scene in part because of how it's set up. Uh, as, as the Lannister Knights are approaching, we get a series of incredibly wacky Dutch angles, uh, which means that the camera is canted but they're sticking cameras in the rafters and then, you know, canting them to the left or the right. So you have this weird tilted frame of a uh, Lannister knight from above dispatching random people. And then the camera goes to the floor and it follows them in the hallway. And we have all of this, uh, like, quick cutting, very common in modern cinema of, of, of the kind of violence they're capable of in which they are. Um, you see a hand and a sword, and then an arm, and then a leg, and then a head, and then blood. And but they're sort of disconnected from bodies um, as a way to simulate uh, the speed and violence of war. And then when we get to Arya and Syria, they are in a nice, steady, long shot. The camera is still in a weird place. It's on the floor, about 15 to 16 feet away from them, so it's uh, angled slightly up to make them look superior, but we have this beautiful symmetry uh, behind them. They are standing each underneath their own arch um, as they're practicing. 
And then the Lannister Knights come in. And it's clearly an invasion of chaos into order. Mm-hmm. Because they set up all of the chaotic elements, and they then they enter this nice symmetrical room. And it it because of I think our natural tendency is is to root for order. Um, you know that most people's complaints with foreign films, uh, besides the fact that they're not in English, is that uh, they don't understand the conventions. It's just all weird. I, I don't know what's going on here. Who's important? Um, they want something nice and orderly, and uh, we get it in the shot, and then it's ruined mm-hmm. by a bunch of large men, manly men, all of whom appear to now be eight feet tall because the camera well, is so low. We're all we're all faceless goons. Yes, um, and they are entering this orderly, this this sort of kind of realm of, 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 of fighting like dancing and, and, and with this effeminate man and a little girl. And someone who's, a spe- who's specifically referred to as a foreigner. Yes. I mean, the, 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 there's, our sympathies are, are, I guess, structurally aligned with the forces of order here. Even though he's a foreigner. And I know how Americans feel about foreigners, but uh, well, I just mean you know specifically you know it's it's a foreigner and a child who's transgressing gender norms, oh, absolutely. you know, about coming under the threat of these, you know, uh, you know, big burly white dudes. It's kind of interesting. And and I, I think we've talked about this before that um, Syria is sort of a weird figure as well because as much as he is um, right out of the Princess Bride. Um, you know, Mandy Patinkin in this sort of swarthy Spanish stereotype of of a not a ladies' man, but um, yeah, ladies' man actually. Um, except Sirio, except Sirio reads gay. Um, my, I, I mean, all of my students read him as homosexual. Uh, they they believe that, and and I had real. Uh, okay, maybe we haven't talked about this, but I ended up coming up with this sort of theory that that one of the reasons maybe um, Ned is okay with handing over his prepubescent daughter to a stranger from a far land and allowing him to you know tutor her for endless hours and give her all these strange, as one of my students pointed out, quasi sexual. He has her chasing pussies all around the city. I'm like, no, let's not oh, go there. Oh, but God. I know. Okay, kids. What can you... It's terrible, but they... Kids. Um, but he that was actually a, a, a minor misstep in a large argument that was interesting about gender normativity and how these two characters uh, defy the standards as set up in the show and in the novel. Um, so it's not just that their serio is not gender normative Generally, but within the context of the show, um, he's different even from Renly and Law. You know, they, they're they still hold to a weird masculine ideal for the most part. Syria. Well, in, in what way doesn't Syria? Well, uh, look at how he dresses. He's wearing a bag, um, like a large brown paper bag. Uh, he's, he's dressed slight- in bravosi clothing. I know, but he's slightly overweight. Uh, the mm-hmm. way he holds his sword versus the way... I mean, there's a... You yeah, know, yeah, but I'm just, I'm just questioning whether we are... whether that's coding traits that are supposed to be foreign as, as sexual... I mean, because, for example, Serial for All in the book is bald. He's very much not bald in the... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and he's also, like, skinny. Uh, um, but again, you know, I'm just saying, I think for a Bravosi man, I think Cyril Farrell kind of exemplifies the sort of the swaggering masculinity of a Bravo. Like, that's what Bravosi man is. actually. I mean, it's a little bit tricky because um, Bravos is this weird mixture between Venice and Amsterdam, so fit in there somewhere. Um, uh, anyway, so I, I think we're going a little bit off track here. Yeah, which is, yeah. But I mean, it is, I, I guess what I will say is um, 
what's interesting is that, like Arya, Sirio is a character who, um, for or otherwise, he doesn't fit in to all of the kind of structures of power we've been talking about in all these podcasts. Yes, uh, he, I will definitely agree with that. He's, he's outside of it, and to a certain degree, we sympathize with him precisely for that reason, because we are also outsiders. I mean, th- th- this, this series, uh, I think better than almost any other, thrusts you into the middle of a class system and, uh, you know, a political hierarchy that is utterly foreign to you and then mm-hmm. shows you a series of wrinkles in it. And so I think when we have a character who's just noble, right? Ned was just noble when the series started, but now he's involved in plots and, and terrible things are happening. Serio is just... He's just noble. Well, and, and I, I would argue that part of the reason that for that is that he's playing the, the role of the Obi-Wan. He is the the substitute father figure, the sort of teacher, mentor, who has to die in order for Arya to move on to the next stage of development. And there, she has a long line of these people. You know, yeah, yeah. her father, Sirio, Yorin, in, in season two, and arguably Jaqen Hagar, in in a at least symbolic way, dies. Yeah. Um. I well, I guess we can just to sort of talk about the the scene right after this. After we have Sirio's good death and every, it's all about you know balance and order and and if you look at the that fight scene instead of all the, the quick order of the force, the balance of the force. Yes, instead of all the quick cuts, you have a. Uh, a, a nice long shot of of Sirio sort of dancing through the Lannister knights with a wooden stick and beating them all, you know, through their armor. Uh, and it's, it's it's lovely. It's balletic. Uh, and he's sort of setting an example for Arya. This is how we deal with our enemies. Remember all of your teachings. And then what does she do? She goes out and she stabs a kid in the gut. Right. Like, she does the exact opposite of everything she's been taught uh, by Sirio, and all of a sudden we're back to Jon Snow and and Ned Stark and the title of the episode. Just the episode, use the pointy yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. Just, just use the pointy end. That, that, that's, that's all you need to know. All of the rest of that is just, you know, flourishes. Um, you don't need all those, you know, seraphs on your letters. Just you go with the normal stuff. Um but it's a even in terms of the direction we go back to a, a close up on Arya, close up on the uh, the the servant boy's face, close up on her hand, close up on his gut, close up on the knife, close up on his gut, close up on her face. So we're back to these sort of weird disjointed human beings. Uh, but it's re- what, what's really strange, and this is only striking me now, as as you were talking about uh, the nobility uh, of his death, is that. The lesson goes unheeded. He dies his great death, and Arya's like, "All right, I will." And then she doesn't. Well, that's, will... that's very that's very different from the book because in the book, there's he's almost like an Obi Wan voice in her head, guiding her through the castle, and like reminding her to be you know as swift as a snake, as silent as you know a shadow, etc., yeah. etc. Et so. That is very much an inversion from the from the book, where he very much is a um, uh, a, a kind of a ghostly presence in her mind as she's making what what you know. And, and let's point this out: this is something of an impossible escape. That you know, this one child manages to slip through a dragnet because she once got lost chasing cats. And found this way out. It's a very sort of French, uh, like French film from the seventies, way to like you know the Nazis are coming. Every everything is falling down all around you, and 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 yet there is one kid with one unicycle so, who gets so out. So Arya and, as uh, Shoshana. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird, um, but yeah, I I think it. 
I think it works. That they they they've done the heavy lifting of setting up how exactly she'll escape, both with the her knowledge of the tunnels and um, chasing around cats. It, it it is plausible, if unlikely. Uh, um, and of course, she escapes to not escaping, but we'll get to that in the next podcast. <laughs> It's like, I'm going to be free of this place. I'm going to leave it forever, and I'm still here. Um, mm-hmm. All right, so do you want to move on to the next thing? Yeah, let's let's move on to the the meeting between Eddard and Varys. <laughs> Very low-key lighting. Not a lot of light in that one, so you'll probably yeah, have to really, do the heavy lift in here. <laughs> well, they, they really like doing these scenes lit by a single torch. Um, and I, I will give them credit. It has an incredibly atmospheric quality to it. Uh, I was Very thinking the, uh, going back to uh, Kubrick's, you know, right where he filmed the entire thing with actual candlelight. Um, everyone yeah. wants to do it. But go on. Sorry. Um, so, you know, the the interesting thing for me in this scene is on the one hand this critical question of what Varys' motivations are here. Because I think on one level he is very much genuine about believing that the realm and serving the realm is his ultimate purpose. At the same time, though, he is not, as he is portraying himself here to be, a disinterested party. He is someone busily trying to engineer, you know, a Targaryen loyalist counter-revolution. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I think one interesting question is what what Eddard Stark's survival would mean for that. Oh, I haven't, I haven't thought about that. Because uh, the question is, he's, he's going out of his way to make sure that Eddard Stark doesn't die here. Um, and, you know, um, not to get too spoilery about a Dance of Dragons, uh, Dance with Dragons, but this become you know, the question of whether and why Varys saves people becomes very important later on. Um, and I've always been curious, and, you know, the, my working hypothesis is essentially that, you know, he doesn't want a civil war... That's um, that's a fight to the death. You know, there there are wars where you can have a peace treaty and move on, and then there are wars in which people will fight to the last man because you know you killed my father and then you killed my uncle and so you know where the blood is just too too entrenched. Uh, you know, it becomes like the Hatfields and the McCoys. No, that that makes sense, and and I mean, I, I guess if if we wanted to be really cynical, we could say that one thing that is clear is that he wants he wants a stake in the outcome, whatever it is, um, and he prefers people owe him as opposed to owing other people, and he he can't raise an army. Um, well, that, but, that you know of. Yes, um, but he can. Uh, he can do palace intrigue. He can uh, still still have his hands in all the pies. And given that it looks like Ned will live, and I'm I'm trying to like project forward, like what what his final play could have could have been. Because if Ned if Ned ends up on the wall, right as as was planned, um, I don't think Jon Snow. A little spoilery. Not really, though. If you've ever seen a movie, ever, the trajectory of Jon Snow is pretty obvious. Uh, that he is he is being born, or, or or not born, but he is being bred for command. He's being right. cultivated. Uh, if Ned ended up on the wall, I think it's pretty clear. Ned, Ned becomes Ned. in charge. And so yeah. Varys is... Pl- but, but that's not part of Littlefinger's... Uh, sorry, Varys' arrangements. I mean... Varys doesn't particularly know Jon Snow from Adam at this point. Well, no, no, but that he, does, we know of. he does know Ned, and he knows that if... if I, I think at this point he knows the deal that, you know, for Ned's life, if he, if he goes to the wall, 
um, if you know if he takes the black, and then he could project forward. Well, if Ned takes the black, you know, clearly within a year, he will be running the whole wall. Yeah, I I, I think it has less to do with Ned and more it's about the houses because the houses are entities above and beyond individuals. The, the individual. So it's it, I think it's more about if the patriarch of House Stark is killed by the crown itself twice in as many generations. Keep in mind, Eddard's father was also executed at the hand of a king. That it's going to be very hard to get the Stark, and you know, as we'll see in in the next couple of episodes, it's going to become very hard to get the, the Starks back into the political nation. Um, whereas if he survives, you know, Rob is probably still going to go to war because, you know, his sisters are prisoners as far as he knows. You know, his uncle and his mother's family are also attack under attack, you know, so that's probably still going to happen, but it's at least a position that you can negotiate backwards from. You know, yeah, once that's... once Ned's dead, there is a problem that in you know there's a roadblock in the way of any peace treaty you know no it's actually it's a really interesting way to think about the whole arc of the first season which is that this is an attempt to turn war into politics yeah um, and I I I think I, well no we're not going to spoil anything because we're talking about season one but I I think you know Joffrey's ultimate decision with Ned is an attempt to turn politics back into war. Uh, in a very petulant, childish way, but but everyone else has been, I don't want to say militating, because that just totally ruins the metaphor, but everyone else has been working very hard to try to, you know, make this into just a chess game where everyone sets up their pieces, and then everyone decides it's just better if we both concede at this point, and, and, and both, I, I guess there's no phrase for cut our gains, but I mean, that's sort of instead of cutting your losses, you're cutting your gains. Well, I, you're 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 uh, stopping all your head. Yeah, um, and everyone sort of mutually agrees that this is we're all better off than we began, except for you know poor Robert Baratheon. But uh, or or at least or at least face has been preserved because you know the interesting thing about this particular war is that you know Tywin. Invades the Riverlands in order because you know because he wants to force an exchange of prisoners for his son on terms that allows his family to save face, and then Rob enters the war because he wants the same thing, um, and he even talks about this um, in uh, the um, the scene where he and Catelyn meet again. Yeah, um, where. It's not in the show, but in the books, he basically says, you know, I, I had hoped that you still had Tyrion because I thought we might be able to work out some sort of deal where, okay, we screwed up by kidnapping Tyrion, you screwed up by kidnap, you know, by imprisoning our father. We make this equal change and nobody has to go to war. And, you know, these strange turns of fate... Uh, are undermining everybody's plans. That Catelyn loses control of Tyrion because her sister is crazy, um, or is she? You know, that's an interesting yeah, yeah. question. And uh, I think she's crazy, but anyway. Go. And and Cersei loses control of Ned because her son is crazy. And and I think we can all agree, Joffrey is genuinely. Yeah, and and the interesting thing is, it's all about timing. A very, very precise timing, if you think about it, right? If, um, well, f for example, if the news of Jamie getting captured by Rob arrives at King's Landing a day earlier, Ned isn't executed. Because uh, now there is a really valuable prisoner who, and now there's a rationale for why you don't execute Eddard Stark is that Jamie might be executed, right? Um, or if you think about, uh, you know, Tyrion and Catelyn, well, if Catelyn had held off on Tyrion a little bit later, when her husband is then imprisoned, then she has 
a very strong reason not to agree to any trial by combat because she's like, okay, I have this other motive for why I want him in prison. So everything is about this very precise timing so that everything can go wrong. You know, what's really interesting is this sort of recapitulates a, a number of uh, academic debates about the writing of history and uh, from the 1970s. I'm thinking of like Hayden White and such. Uh, the idea of history as necessity versus history as contingency. Yeah. Um, this almost the way that you're that you're describing this, it's almost as if George R. R. Martin is an historian of a fictional world who is writing a history in which contingency became necessity. In in other words, that all these things had to be precisely timed in yeah. order for this to work out exactly as it did. And there, if there were any rogue elements. Or, 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 or if anything that had happened that, would, that, that was ill-timed, none of what we see would have occurred, which is a really, yeah. it's really weird to think about that uh, sort of logic applying not to turning, you know, a historical chronicle into, which is just a list of things that happened, into a narrative, which is a description of why these things had to happen in the way that yeah. they did. Um, but we're turning sort of a fictional world into a... Uh, sort of meta narrative about the necessity of, of oddly Joffrey's rise to power. Um, yeah, I mean the the sort of the flip side of that is another way that you can look at this, and, and I've written a little bit about this, is sort of George R. R. Martin as kind of the the Greek gods in a tragedy. <laughs> that, you know, he will arrange things so that they, you know, just enough things go wrong in order to make these horrible things happen. I mean, if you think about, uh, I, I use the example of Catelyn Stark, you know, a woman defined by family, you know, whose who's the, the words of her house are, all, are family first. You know, she is all about trying to protect her family. And Martin arranges events such that she, in many ways, is indirectly the cause, and I want to stress very clearly, she is not responsible for, she is indirectly the cause of, the destruction of her entire family. And, you know... The haters are all typing away right now saying horrible things about you, but go on. Well, I mean, it, it reminds me of, um, you know, uh, uh, Oedipus, or, or, you know, tragedies like that, where you can see the, the sort of the machinery of fate being constructed you know, this Rube Goldberg contraption that every last <laughs> bit is going to happen in just the right way or the wrong way from the Stark's perspective to put her at the Red Wedding. Um, you know, because as, as I explained, this is why I have in every chapter a what-if section. You know, there are tons of moments in time in which a slight change completely throws off, I mean everything that's going to happen. The, you know, I've argued, basically, the Lannisters won the war because they were incredibly lucky. Every turning point that had to happen just the way it did in order for them to succeed, they could have lost a thousand different ways. So yeah, Absolutely, and, and yet in, in the sort of classic fashion, I, I've, I've been uh, interviewing this psychologist at the University of Illinois for a story I'm writing for the Raw Story, and it, it's about... Uh, wealthy people on juries and their perception of uh, culpability essentially How, you know what are you and are you not responsible for and it's it turns out it's better to get poor people on juries because poor people believe that you your actions actually have um, are sort of meaningless and put you in positions but wealthy people believe that everything you've ever done in your life uh, has led you to the place that you are now. Right. So for for them personally, they believe that they've earned their wealth um, by having been born wealthy, um, and every decision they made has helped them to retain their wealth. Whereas poor people end up murdering people because they were poor and had to. Uh, but it's this very sort of deterministic uh, mm -hmm. view. Tywin Lannister fits in perfectly with this paradigm, in 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 terms of. Everything having to be in the right place at the right time for a Lannister victory. No, he's taking full fucking credit. Right? I arranged all of this. I was the mastermind. Yeah, of course. All but of those scenes in, in later seasons of him writing the right letter at the right moment, or yeah, having... yeah. But, but and and part of this has to be, I have to say, thrown 
at you know uh, between the feet of the showrunners like a gauntlet because they screwed up. I think the best example of this, which is the battle at the stone mill, right re from the beginning of season three. In the books, that is not just the mountain. It's Tywin hurling his entire army at this river, trying to cross back into the Westerlands because Robb Stark has been burning his home territory, right? And if he gets across this river, he's too far away to, to stop King's Landing from falling. And the Edmure holds him back successfully, and therefore he's on the right side of the river when the messenger gets there to say, you know, come back, we need you at King's Landing. So, you know, yes, Tywin sets many things up quite, you know, intelligently. I mean, the, the Frey and the Bolton plot. At the same time, what he's not willing to admit, but what is very evident, is George it's R. R. Martin bastard. set... Yeah, he's a very lucky bastard. And But, of, of course, if you're born wealthy, you're never lucky. Um, you, you have to work your way up from the bottom. It, it's tough being wealthy. Um, and powerful. And white. And male. Yeah, but, and, and I think even if you look at the background of Tywin, right comes from an incredibly wealthy family, but because of his father, you know, being kind of incompetent, etc., he almost has sort of this, like, self-made man image going, that, like, I'm the one who made this family what it is. I rescued us from, you know, almost destruction. Ergo, I can do no wrong. I know, and you can see how he's setting up all of his children to do the exact same. Whichever one of Jamie you know, Cersei and Tyrion ends up in control of, uh, of House Lannister is going to be like, I really fucking earned this. Did you, did you see my dad? Like, <laughs> but, I mean, that's the thing. It's, did you see my dad? And, yes, Tywin Lannister is, 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 is a terrible example of, of humanity, but uh, they make a, a convincing emotional case, if, if not, you know, socioeconomic. But if, if Tyrion ends up in control of House Lannister... You're not going to say, oh, you didn't earn that. I mean, you, you didn't make that. It, it, it'd be like, no, nah, no, nah, Darian, I don't want to say worked way up from the bottom because it's just going to turn into a short joke, but um, but he really has, and our sympathies would be with him. And, and But still, Tyrion is born into a place of great privilege and wealth, and, you know, as as his father likes to remind him, you wouldn't even be alive if I weren't this wealthy and powerful. No. No, he, he's, he says specifically, you wouldn't be alive if I hadn't decided not to murder you. Well, yeah. I mean, that's that's a little bit... I mean, yeah. Tyrion does admit that, you know, had he been born a peasant, he might have been exposed on a hillside. But, you know, Tywin, like, literally says, like, I was thinking about killing you, and I decided not to. And it's just... Eesh. All right, we're, we're getting way off track again. Um, that's okay. Why don't we move on to uh, John and uh, talk some zombie theory. All right. Uh, so, you know, moving from, I think, one of the best fight sequences, uh, <laughs> we get to one of the most sort of disappointing fight sequences. And I think this is partly just, you know, where the technology uh, was for, for the showrunners at that time, like, clearly... They switched FX companies uh, between seasons <laughs> because this is not a very good zombie fight scene. Um, no. And in the books, this is a truly horrific moment. I mean, it is like a genuine horror story. You know, Jon Snow is dealing with, uh, you know, he, first of all, he's on the losing side of this fight almost the whole way through the fight. He's got, uh, the, the thing that really got me was, at one point, the thing is, like, trying to strangle him, and it puts its fingers in his mouth. And there's just something viscerally awful about the idea of, like, a dead person's fingers in your mouth. And once he cuts the hand off, it's scuttling around, grabbing at his legs. You know, and this is a pretty scary zombie in the sense that knocking off the head doesn't do it. Um, you know, if you chop pieces off, they keep moving. It doesn't 
hunger for brains. It's got some intentionality to it. Um, and, you know, it, it's a great moment in the show, uh, sorry, in the books, in part because we don't get a whole lot of the zombies. You know, we get them here, we get them at the very beginning of book three, and then we get reports of them throughout the next couple books. That's it. It's very off stage. But the moments in which they are on screen are dramatic enough that they really kind of, you know, keep that threat alive. And I just didn't feel it in this scene. I, I didn't either, but I do like, and, and we talked about this in season three with Sam and, and how he killed a zombie and, and, and turned it into a bunch of shards of... I, I no, mean, he, not, not a zombie. That's a white no, walker. No, sorry, that's a white walker. Sorry, sorry. Uh, the zombies. Uh, I, I like this new trend of not having rules um, because, you know, we have all of these... Um, sort of killjoy arguments about why zombies couldn't exist. Um, their organs would rot. They and, and that, that that's fine. I mean, yes, the science is it, for zombies is awful. Like the zombie apocalypse, like that will never happen. It'll be much more like something, uh, you know, rage like, virus. Well, yeah, or that that fungus that 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 affects ants and takes over their central nervous system. And ah, you read the same cracked article that I did. Uh, I didn't, but uh, okay. Oh, yes. okay. No, right. I, no, I, I'm cool. I read cracked. What are you talking about? Yeah, I read cracked. Um, I don't not read cracked. I just didn't read that article. But uh, uh, see, so yeah, cool. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's it would be a sort of it would be something that where the rules would not be easily determined. And I think that's to 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 just jump shows real quickly. I think it's one thing that The Walking Dead as a TV series has done very well. It hasn't. Given us the rules, people keep saying what the rules are. You got to shoot it in the head. You got to, but there are clearly other rules that they have no clue about. Um, and there are I mean, now. It's also been wildly inconsistent about its own rules. I know, and but that's what that's that's epidemiology. I mean, epidemiology is you go and you know you go into a situation. You know, I, I you think about something like uh, the first doctors. Uh, who were responding to the Ebola epidemics in Africa in in the 1980s, and they were they just got there and were like, "What the fuck? You're bleeding out of every orifice." And by orifice, I'm including your pores, right? I mean, it's just you, you don't know what the rules are when you encounter these things for the first time, um, or even the second time if they're as effective as killing as something like Ebola is. And to me, that strikes me as a more accurate kind of encounter with anything we would like to call a zombie apocalypse. It would be, we just don't know. That's why I, uh, to, and I'm just sort of jumping around, but, but, but something like Octavia Butler's Xenogenesis trilogy, um, Octavia Butler, the, the reason her books are great is because her aliens are alien. They make no sense to us because they evolved on a planet that isn't anything remotely like Earth. They have means of communication. So when you encounter them, you're not like, oh, I've, I, I can figure this out. You seem to fit, you know, Hollywood conventions for what we do for an alien. Hold on, let me sneeze on you. Wait, that didn't work. Fuck, it worked in War of the Worlds. But, you know, I like the fact that, that, that the magic, at least up to this point in the series, isn't being explained. And, I, you know, we can talk about Melisandre later. But right now, it, it, it's sort of classic... You know, anything, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology Looks will be like interpreted, magic. yeah, as magic. And and uh, I like that approach. I don't want to know the rules. Because if I know the rules, it all gets predictable. I mean, that's why Zombieland is funny but not very good, for example. For example. Mm-hmm. Um, no, you see, you told okay. me we could do zombie theory, and so now my head's all in zombie theory, and we're supposed to be talking about Game of Thrones. Yeah, okay, so moving Sorry, on to Paris. Sansa. Um, you know, the, the scene where uh, she's convinced to write the letters, um, where she's trying to, to rescue her father. Um, the only thing I'd say about here is, you know, I don't know if you, you saw 
George R. R. Martin's comments about which characters have changed between book and the show, and he was a little bit critical of Aidan Gillen's uh, performance as um, as Littlefinger. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about uh, this scene in the book. Uh, Littlefinger is so much more subtle in the show, in this scene. I mean, in the books, he's practically drooling over Sansa. And he's just like, look at her hair. She looks just like her mother did at that age. You know. Nothing creepy about that. Nothing. And, and it's, you know, everyone in the room has kind of got him pegged. Well, I, I think I think you just can't depict that on television. You can't just have lonely, horny old man lusting over the daughter of the woman he loves. I mean, that's well, he's got to. I mean, at some point. Uh, well, that's... yeah, no, I mean, yeah, yeah. Eventually, we're gonna have to get to that, but she'll be a little older by the time the series gets around to doing that. Well, that might be this season. I mean, this coming season. You, you think? I, well, I, I, you know better than I, but... Uh, well, all I'll say is that if you've been uh, looking at uh, where... If you go to the IMDB page for some of the episodes, and okay. you look at, at some of the people listed as where they are in which episode... Um, I, anyway, I'll leave it there. I, I, yeah, no, I, I don't. I, I specifically don't do that. I, I try to avoid spoilers, even though I they're not really spoilers because I've read all the damn books. But um, I, I sort of don't want to know where it's going in that respect. But but I mean, I think my point still stands. Uh, anything filmed last year with Sansa for this upcoming season, she would be at least three years older than the scene that we're talking about. Right. Um, which makes it. Still creepy in terms of family dynamics, but in terms of pedophilia, it it it's a little less creepy. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, uh, I think the other thing is they, they 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 need to, for lack of a better way of saying it, they they do still need to establish Littlefinger as the ultimate smooth operator because of what's going to be going on in, in subsequent seasons. So if they had a scene that was as obvious as its counterpart in the novel, I mean, what, yeah. what, I mean, you could say, well, real subtle there. Yeah, I mean... Your little the, okay, fingers so, seem a bit like... like yeah. 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 So the other thing I wanted to say about this, this scene is that I find Cersei's plan here to be a little bit weird in that, uh, you know, I mean, granted, Cersei is not the most strategic of thinkers, um, but her idea that if she just sends a letter from Sansa, you know, that that Rob is not going to march, it doesn't seem to make sense even from her perspective. Like, you know, you, you might as well say, well, you know, uh, when when... Uh, Catelyn had kidnapped Tyrion, that the Lannisters weren't going to do anything because that might hurt Tyrion. Well, no, you know, Tywin's response to that is, okay, I'm going to start kidnapping Starks, you know, if I can, in order to get this, you know, the, the, the solution to the, you know, the situation in which, you know, you have a family member under threat is you even the sides. So I just, I don't get what her thinking is in this particular scene. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I think the, the modus operandi is perpetual escalation. You take one of mine, I take one right. of yours, you take one of mine. And, and eventually, if you think about the logical conclusion of that, everyone, they basically just traded castles. Like, eventually, there'll be more Starks over there than there are in Winterfell and more Lannisters uh, in Winterfell. Than, and, but uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 that would actually be interesting if they just woke up one day and realized, holy shit, we just traded castles. We, we yeah. didn't even... We're terrible at hostages taking. But um, okay. So, uh, is there anything you want to say about the Robin and Theon scene? Theon is has yet to really become interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of it's functional. It's a a nice. It's it's a rare moment in which they see, we see them as friends, which you kind of have to in order for what happens next to work. But you know, it's nothing special. 
No, and I think for most of the, the first season, Theon is underutilized, um, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll talk a little more about Theon later. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so then we get the scene with Catelyn and her sister Lysa, which is like weirdly out of place, uh, in the sense that kind of in the books when this happens, it's it's much much earlier. It's like a couple episodes uh, backwards. Um, not a whole lot to say there, really. Uh, I did want to talk about the Tyrion scene uh, right. with Bronn, which is quite interesting because in the books, his kind of um, his his kind of setting up of a um, a modus vivendi with Bronn takes place at the same time that he tells Bronn about Taisha. And it's very explicit that, you know, that there's something about creating this working relationship and telling Bronn this story that, you know, is really about Tyrion at his most vulnerable. Um, that sort of sets up the stage for later on because... Bronn's response is, uh, you know, well, you know, father or no, I'd kill the man who did that to you. And Tyrion says, well, you might get the chance. Remember, a Lannister always pays his debts. And he has this dream in which he, he becomes more the jailer and his father becomes him. And it's a really interesting moment, um, and they've kind of excised that completely. Yeah, I mean, it's, and, and, and you know, I've mentioned before that my students absolutely love the tyrion Braun relationship because on the one hand, if, if, if I just mention the word homosociality and then they look it up online and then they see these two men bonding over stories of fucking, um, they're like, oh, this is a textbook case of it. But I do think there's more to it than that. There is that, you know, genuine affection that Bronn has for Tyrion, in part because he's still alive. And he's not, a, you know, a, a swordsman. So, I think taking that bit out might have just been because the point's already been made. These two guys are together holding hands, skipping through fields of daisies. Well, um, ex except they're not. I mean, it's... It, I, I think that gets the relationship wrong, which is like all of Tyrion's relationships, it's much more fraught with tension. And the central tension is you know, is Bronn in this for the money? And to what extent? See, I don't get that at all. I, I don't think Bronn... I'm just saying from the text. Yeah, from, from the I text. Mean they, you know, and, and even in the show, you know, Bronn clearly likes Tyrion. But there are limits to what Bronn is going to do. You know, at, well, you know, we see this. We see this in the very first episode of season three, in which, you know, Tyrion is, you know, alone and vulnerable, and Bronn's response to this is to say, "Well, I'm upping my prices." That's the language of their love. Um, uh, all it, right, fine. I mean, it, I mean, in a way, I mean, you see what I'm saying? Like, everyone has a has a way of sort of. Um, deciding how they're going to talk about the relations. And in a, in a society that is not as open about any sort of non-traditional relationship, this weird friendship between a little person and, you know, a sellsword, that, that's a way for them to normalize it, right? It, it's sort of uh, kind of enforcing the normality of it. Oh, well, I'll just help my... If you need more help, I'll up my prices. But if it came down to it, I, I, I think... We'd agree that, that Braun would do it anyway. Uh, you don't think? Season four. I mean, we're we're, you know, I don't want to spoil anything, but you know, I'm I'm willing to take any bets. <laughs> <laughs> That's how confident I am. On this. <laughs> no spoilers, but you're willing to take any bets. Yeah. I'm, I'm not perfectly a gambling willing man, to, especially not with you about this. Uh, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to exploit my knowledge of this series and the desire of some people not to be spoiled to make a lot of money. 
Um, so let's move on to Danny. All right. All right. Uh, just because this is a very long episode, and there's a lot to get through. Um, so you know what I what I like about um, this part of Danny's story is that you know there are a lot of stories that are about you know the rightful prince or the rightful heir to the throne, you know, trying to take on the usurper. And they never sort of think about, well, what are the costs of heroism? You know, and, and in this case, you know, Danny is, in a sense, responsible for, you know, warfare, enslavement, you know, all of these horrible things that are happening because wars take money. And... This is sort of the 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 consequence of that you know WWF uh, promo speech in the last episode, um, and you know the, the other thing that you don't really get very much in the show, but that this scene very much explains, is the role of the Dothraki as part of of Essos's economy. In that you know a huge part of Essos is a slave economy, and the Dothraki are essentially the um, they're the source of the labor supply. They round up people and sell them. Um, they're also kind of responsible for kind of the circulation of people and goods across the continent because they're nomadic. You know, they'll take people that they capture over in one place and they'll bring them over to another place. Uh, so that's kind of a level of nuance that you, I don't think the show quite accomplishes. Just to say, you know, there, there's more to the Dothraki than, than meets the eye. Um, and then the other thing I like about the scene is the addition of the fight sequence, which is quite well done. Um, and, you know, they put that in specifically at Jason Momoa's request uh, because, as he pointed out, you know, he's been playing this badass warrior and he's never had a fight sequence and he's about to die. So they're going to give him a kind of, you know, just like Ned got the, the, the bit where he could fight Jamie. You know, they're giving him this. I mean, why, why actually have him in the series if you're not going to actually... I mean, he has all these muscles. They're not just they're not just there for sitting on the throne and watching yeah. your wife eat a horse heart, right? I mean, you you need to do something with all these. So, I I agree. And I, I I mean, so I, and I, it's a, it's a better way for him to get the fatal boo boo. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just weird because I still think of him as a gentle giant, and I this is a part I, if, for all of you Stargate Atlantis fan that you know uh, was that it Stargate Atlantis one one of those Stargate shows that he was on. Where he was just like a giant nice man. Mm -hmm. um, it was really difficult for me to see him as anything, but until this moment, it's like, oh, he wasn't just sitting there. He was, he was, you know. Well, he was just sitting there part. next to a giant pile of human heads. Yeah. You know, there's a limit to the niceness. Well, but still, I mean, we we didn't get to see him in action, and and now that I think about it, this episode is really about. Following through on your word, like, <laughs> right? Sirio telling Arya, and then Arya just doing a Stark thing and stabbing him in the gut, and and but yeah, it's a a lot of death, and that, and, and and that is one thing I think we should talk about. Uh, um, do you want to talk about any other scenes before we? Uh, I mean the so last. All right, sorry, I was trying to prop something up, and it's just not working. Um, so the you know the scene where Catelyn and Rob meet um, is different from the books in that you know in in the books Rob Stark is supposed to be 14 years old so there's a different relationship there you know in one case you basically have a matured almost adult uh, in the show and in the other case you have someone who you know you haven't yet found out as a military prodigy. Um, but, you know, and his mother. And, you know, this is where, you know, there's a large segment of the fandom who feels that the Catelyn character has, w was entirely mishandled um, throughout the show. And in order to essentially bulk up Rob Stark 
as a character. And, you know, I, I, I was just thinking because, you know, in this scene, you know, I think you actually have something fairly even-handed in that, you know, Rob Stark is a more intelligent, fleshed-out character, but his mother is also given a lot of political sense. Um, and I, so I was sort of thinking, you know, it's kind of a pity because I think this scene shows that that could have worked. I think it. I, th I think it did work for what it was, though, as well. I mean, in that she is standing up not to her fourteen-year-old son, but to a man in control of arms. I mean, it, it makes it makes her a more sort of interesting figure to be standing up to this older version, more mature version of Rob than it would her dressing down her kid, essentially. Yeah. Which is if you you know just to take a step back in the books, that's exactly what she's doing. Um, yeah, I, I see. I, I probably need to read more of the things written by the fandom because I just I, I think I think Catelyn's actually much more interesting in the series uh, than she is in the novels. But uh, I'll probably get well. Hate um, it. If you all I can say is if just go on Tumblr and look at uh, Game of Thrones tag and you can. Oh, what is a like Tumblr? That. You kids these days with your tumbling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get off my lawn. Um, <laughs> uh, well, the the one the one other thing I wanted to talk about, and mm -hmm. because this is so central to the show's dynamic, uh, that it's become a punchline in various episodes of South Park, a couple of uh, skits on Saturday Night Live. Uh, what do we do with all these dead people? Uh, don't love anyone because they will die. Anytime you like someone, die, right? Serio's the first. He's the first character we've been made to feel really sympathetic to. Wow, you don't really care about Jory Cassell at all, do you? No, I don't, actually. <laughs> and then I... I yeah, but, but yeah, uh, he is, he is a, 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 I would say, a sort of a signal. He Well, but he's... He's a much more important character in the novels than he is in the show, where he's guy standing there next to. I mean, right? He's not like caring for the daughter of 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 the hand. I mean, it, it, it's he he's. I'm I'm not gonna say disposable because again, don't want hate mail. But he's nowhere near as sort of significant to the development of a major character. As Serio is mm -hmm. in the show, I guess, um, and we're we're being asked to, to you know think about Serio's noble death, his defense of Arya, uh, and it's at least for me, and 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 your your experience is different, and I'm sure the uh, people will probably send me nasty emails anyway, but I. I think that's the first time we're really being asked to mourn someone mm -hmm. in a show that's going to ask us to do that repeatedly. Right. Uh, and I think it's wonderful that the first time they did it, it's off screen. We don't, actually, we don't actually get to see it. We just have to assume and put all of my cockamamie theories out of, out of you know, uh, this context. If this is Serio's last stand, we were, I mean, it's a very, you know, very gladiator-esque, you know, those who are about to die, we salute you. It, it's, it's a very moving mm -hmm. moment. And the fact is that the, literally the last moment in diegetic terms in which Serio is alive, we're looking at Arya trying really hard not to cry. Right. Right before she runs away. And then he's gone. Right. Uh, why don't we leave it at there, just because right. I'm getting the hurry-up signal here. Okay. Um, all right, well, this has been a Lawyer's Guns Money podcast. Uh, abruptly canceled. No, not canceled, but... Uh, 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 we've no. run out of things to talk about, pretty much. Oh, oh yes. Oh, I could talk all day. No, no, I really couldn't. Um, all right, so uh, thank you for listening and or watching, and uh, we will see you soon. All right, bye-bye.